Cliff, let's get started. So we all know what has happened this weekend. So if you could just walk us through a brief overview of how Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank ran into trouble. For example, what were the strategies and events that led to the demise? Yeah, no problem. I, um, I, I like to think of it as kind of like the confluence of uh, a series of, of problematic events that sort of took place uh, all kind of coming together at one thing. So the first thing that uh, the Signature Bank, I'll speak to them first since they sort of were the catalyst for everything else that came along here recently, including today's issues with uh, Credit Suisse kind of rattling the markets and whatnot. But um, they were uh, over-concentrated, quite honestly, in, in one sector. Uh, much of their, their business model was oriented toward tech and venture capital. And those folks need to have uh, access to, to cash to run those businesses. And so they were uh, putting deposits into Signature Bank uh, Signature Bank was about $200 plus billion dollars in assets. If you compare that to some of the really big systemically important banks like you know, JP Morgan or Citigroup, we're talking you know, trillions or so. So it's, it's, it's small by comparison to that, but large, relatively speaking, in terms of the overall banking community. So uh, the question comes down later on if we get to it as to whether or not it was systemically important or not to warrant what the FDIC did. Um, so they were... So they were concentrated into tech and venture capital. Uh, on top of that, they were highly uh, dependent, in this case, on those deposits. Uh, for comparison, Bank of America, about 70% of all of their liabilities are in deposit accounts, retail or non-retail accounts, we'll call it, checking accounts, savings accounts, all these things. Uh, by comparison, uh, Silicon Valley Bank had about 90% in these kinds of deposits to these, to these institutions, these companies. So that made them vulnerable that when things went down the wrong side, the second thing that they did was they, they didn't manage interest rate risk very well. So fixed income 101, if you've taken that course with Professor Renal back in the day, you know that if yields go up, the prices of bonds go down. And what they did was that they actually invested very heavily into two parts of their balance sheet. They separated their balance sheet into two parts. One is called their held to maturity or HTM. And again, I've got we've got our expert here, Marty, who's going to bail me out on this because I'm just a finance and risk guy. But uh, under HTM, uh, they don't have to mark those assets to to market, and so they carry that at typically like around big book value versus this uh, available for sale portfolio. Available for sale uh, are are assets that are treated as if they can be sold, traded uh, whenever the bank needs to buy or sell these assets and move them around. Whereas ATM, again, is we're going to hold this asset till its maturity, and that's what our intention is. Under AFS, they have to fair value accounting that or market to market. And that's where things get interesting, because when they were sitting on top of these, these, they, back in, you know, when 2021 was around, rates were relatively low, 2022 starts to show up. And what does the Fed do but start increasing interest rates to try and tamp down inflation? So they're sitting on top of fairly longer uh, maturing, we call it duration in our side of the business, assets uh, that were in US treasuries and mortgage-backed securities. And it turns out that those kinds of longer duration assets are more exposed to interest rate shocks than shorter duration assets. Well, make a long story short on this, they wound up actually uh, experiencing losses on both of those portfolios. Uh, because of this increase in interest rates that caused the decline in the value of their AFS portfolio predominantly because that was the one that was taking these marks. Well, I'm not going to get into all the arcane accounting rules, but that actually, those losses, they call those unrealized losses, went directly into the balance sheet and get recorded against equity. And so when a bank like Signature Bank and or Silicon Valley Bank then are realizing that these losses are going against their tangible common equity to assets ratio. It causes that capital to get smaller, that capital ratio to get smaller. And that's where things get interesting for banks like this because they depend on that capital to survive through you know, extreme events. So they had to go out and raise some money to try and deal with that, to try to bolster their capital position, raised uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of about 2 billion, about 1.8, I think it was. And uh, that's when, again, things got a little uh, off kilter when depositors started to realize, well, maybe there's problems at this bank. 
and they experience something that is totally extraordinary. Somebody who's been in the business, as, as, as we've said, about 25 years, never seen a deposit run of $42 billion in a single day, which accounted for about 25% of the deposits for that institution. And the rest is history. When the FDIC saw that, they had to rush in uh, full guns blazing, so to speak, and uh, take them over and put them into receivership. So that uh, was the, the nature of the problem. I will also say this, um, is that uh, they, they suffered from very poor governance at the board level. Their corporate governance was bad, and I'll get into that perhaps later. Uh, and their risk management practices were terrible. They're, they're, the, I was looking at their, their 10K, for example, for 2022, and on the itemization levels there for a uh, notional amount of interest rate hedges that they put on against this AFS portfolio, it was a tiny fraction of what the unhedged position in that AFS portfolio was. So it was astounding and just an astounding uh, screw up to say, to say it that way of, of at basic asset liability management that should otherwise have been protecting that bank. So that was a long-winded, long-winded answer. No, thank you for giving us this primer on the difference between the HTM and for, as an accounting professor, it was good to hear that other people also learn the difference between AFS and HTM securities and how it affects the accumulated other comprehensive income, which filters down to the balance sheet. So thanks again for that. So I have a question about where these banks insolvent when FDIC stepped in or at what point did they become insolvent? So that's a, that is a great question. So, so uh, technically the FDIC can step in uh, uh, under what are called prompt corrective action rules, PCA. And uh, even when there's a positive uh, tangible capital ratio at the institution, meaning that they're technically solvent, they can take them, they can take them into receivership because they, they create such a, an exposure to the overall system that they merit doing that. So that's effectively what was going on here, um, that the, uh, they knew that without doing that, the institution would have become uh, insolvent and would have been worse off for that. So uh, trying to be proactive in this case is probably good practice uh, from a regulatory standpoint. Thanks. So, you know, you, I think you mentioned this in your first, but I want to ask you a little more. So what is really a liquidity crisis for a bank and what causes it and what could have been done to prevent it? I know you address some yeah. of them, but if you can, you know, go a little further, what really yeah. is a liquidity crisis? And I'm going to go back and hit your thing on, 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 on the finance guy and accounting and I'm up in a second here, because I, I will tell you a, a funny story that, uh, you know, I, I used to tout myself as being very proud of the fact I never I got out of my entire undergraduate program without ever, without ever taking an accounting class. Mm -hmm. But as soon as I had to sign my first Sarbanes-Oxley sub-attestation, when I became a CRO, I soon learned to be an, a, a student <laughs> of accounting because I didn't look good in stripes. So anyway, right. <laughs> uh, but uh, from a liquidity crisis standpoint, let me let me put it in personal terms. Let's suppose that you're on your way to work, you get in your car, you're driving down the road, you hear a clunk underneath the car, uh, you get towed in, mechanic, mechanic takes a look at it and says, that's going to be $5,000, please. And you look in your checking account, you have $100 in your checking account, your credit cards are tapped out, total to the max, and your friends and family aren't going to extend you any credit. That is a personal liquidity crisis. Magnify that by billions of dollars, and this is what you're looking at whenever a bank faces their own kind of liquidity crisis. And a liquidity crisis for a bank can actually expose itself on either side of the balance sheet. It can be something like what we saw here with SVB and with Signature, and that it's a classic bank run where depositors, you see them wrapped around the blocks of their retail branches. They want their money out as soon as they can get it. It's kind of like the image that you see from It's a Wonderful Life right? When Jimmy Stewart's kind of shutting down the bank and everybody kind of rushes in and they want their money out. Same kind of deal. It can also come from, a, from the asset side of the ledger as well. You can see uh, it come from excessive losses that were unexpected. Uh, those kinds of things can actually cause the problem as well. So it can, it can emanate from either side of the balance sheet. But most of the time for banks, what you see a liquidity crisis stem from is the fact that they have insufficient uh, funding to support the extreme cash outflows that they're experiencing at that time. It's really a, a cash flow pinch that they are experiencing. And 
they can't, they, they, they just don't have the money. They can't sell the assets fast enough to get at it, or they sell them at such a fire sale price, as in the case of those AFS assets that were already beat up because of increased interest rates, that they were going to take a serious hit uh, to, to the value of that when they sold them out. So uh, to do that, they were going to go raise capital and try and uh, get out from under it. But then the depositors found out and the rest is history, as they say. Thanks, Cliff. So, you know, what we as individual consumers, we all are interested in doing, okay, this happened to Silicon Valley Bank, this happened to Signature Bank. Can this happen to my local community bank? Can this happen to SunTrust Bank? I mean, we see everywhere that all accounts are in, insured up to $250,000. So as an individual consumer, as an individual investor, should I be worried? I don't think so. Uh, I, I, to answer your first question, it is possible that, that any bank is susceptible to a bank run or a liquidity crisis or event. It can either happen idiosyncratically, meaning there's something that's specific to that firm, like in the case of both of these institutions, uh, uh, that, 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 that cause that to, to be the case. Um, it can be sectoral, uh, or as we saw in the case of 2008, uh, it becomes systemic. So it can happen a variety of different ways. I wouldn't worry too much about the fact that uh, this is going to cascade into something more significant, famous last words, uh, but I really don't think that that's gonna be the case. And the reason why I say that is, is, is really in part because the steps that the FDIC took uh, this past week uh, to uh, ensure even the uninsured depositors of uh, the bank uh, basically is saying, look, we're here to make sure that everybody's made whole. There's a lot of debate about whether that's a bailout, whether that is, you know, the right thing to do to stem a, con a contagion effect where, you know, something that happens with SVB that happens to Signature, then kind of, you know, it's like a domino effect, right? So that's what the FDIC was trying, I believe, to deal with, was to stop that in its tracks, to, to take the animal spirits out of uh, the equation from the standpoint of depositors wanting to take their money out of other institutions. If they see, hey, look, the FDIC is going to make everybody whole, it's kind of like that image again from uh, It's a Wonderful Life when Jimmy Stewart starts handing dollars out to people and they start saying, okay, I think I can, I, I'm okay, I'll be, I'm, I'm going to be okay on this. So that's kind of what, what I think uh, is going to happen. But I, 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 I have, me personally, I do not believe that this will be anything close to, to what 2008 was like. I just don't see that. And, and you got to remember, too, that the large banks, the money center banks, the, J, the JP Morgan's, the city groups where I used to work, um, they have lots and lots of capital. Ever since 2008, their, regula their regulators have really significantly increased the amount of capital that they have to have. They have to abide by something called the liquidity coverage ratio and net stable funding ratios, which are two liquidity ratios that are mandated for all institutions above $250 billion in assets. That means that they have the amount of high quality liquid assets, cash, uh, easily saleable treasuries during a fire sale that could be liquidated and sold off uh, in a time of crisis without taking too much of a hit. Thanks, Cliff. So you said that the FDIC did the right thing. I want to push back on that. Is that the right strategy? Does that create a moral hazard or um, other situations, it I, does. I, I had to ask that. No, you and you're right to ask. You absolutely are right to ask that. I struggle with it myself, to be quite honest. Um, I do think it creates a moral hazard. There is always this issue that deposit insurance creates that, particularly when it was flat-based uh, deposit insurance pricing. Now we have more of a, ri uh, a risk-based pricing system on deposit insurance, and so that's helped a little bit. But uh, nonetheless, um, it 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 it. It lurks out there, this moral hazard does, because of the FDIC's actions to insure the uninsured depositors, right? Those are folks that are, you know, uh, taking no risk, and the bank management team see that and go, hey, you know, I could probably throw the long ball here and know that the FDIC is going to protect us. We saw that, actually, and I started my career off, yes, I am that old, started my career off during the the 1980s with the SNL crisis at uh, one of the bank at the SNL regulator actually, and uh, and we saw a lot of that behavior, that moral hazard behavior, and and it's still alive and well today. We have not resolved that 
uh, effectively. And it is just the nature of the banking system that it's that it's there. The flip side of that argument again comes back to: um, Do we wait for you know if we didn't protect those uninsured depositors? Uh, do we wait to see the reaction of other depositors? To your point, do do I? wake up the next morning, go to my son trust. Do I go to my bank of America and say, I got to get my money out. I'm going to put it in the mattress extreme as it is, or do we, so that contagion effect, uh, it, it's a gamble, right? So I don't know what the right answer is on that. Uh, time will only tell. I think, uh, the, the other shoe that dropped today with credit Suisse was probably more nervousness in the market over what had just happened with SVB and signature in the last several days, as opposed to this is tied in some way systemically like it was to a great deal of banks that created a daisy chain because they had so many interlinkages going on. Thanks, Cliff. So, I mean, again, this is this is not an easy question to answer, the moral hazard issue. So a general question, is the banking system at risk because of the FDIC insurance? What is your take on that? You know, um, I would say no. And, and again, I'll come back to uh, the, the the largest institutions, the the again, those that are above 250 that present the most risk to the to the banking system are well capitalized. Uh, they even have surcharges on their capital. Uh, so they have buffers that are even well above above that. Uh, they have these liquidity coverage ratios. Uh, the degree of regulatory scrutiny on on the big guys, so to speak, is is intense. Doesn't mean that they can't get into trouble from time to time, like we saw, you know, with Wells Fargo and the retail banking scandal recently, and even Citigroup, you know, had a four hundred million dollars civil money penalty levied against it uh, because of poor or deficient risk management capabilities. Um, but uh, by and large, the banking system is 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 pretty intact, and I and I wouldn't see. You, know, you have to go back and think about what's different about 2008 than today that would make me concerned. And I would say this, that uh, first of all, in, in 2008, it was, it was tied to subprime mortgage assets where the loan manufacturing processes associated with those were quite deficient, right? So poor underwriting, poor collateral valuation, uh, slapping those into what we call private label mortgage-backed securities and then selling them off to, to investors that had no idea what was hiding in beneath those. This is a totally different animal, right? And in that case, in 2008, we had you know banks selling these assets two and three times again, right? Derivatives of derivatives uh, circulating around the system until finally when the music stopped, as Chuck Prince, you know, the former CEO of Citigroup once said, uh, you know, you got to keep dancing until the music stops. And when the music stopped, it was over. Here, this was precipitated by problems that were probably, uh, uh, like I said, I mean, we, we, we have got, you know, we, we're not used to seeing uh, a rising interest rate risk environment. Oh, there he is. There's Bill. There's Bill. And, okay. And so, and so I would just end on this note and say that I think that at, at the end of the day, um, we're dealing with a completely different interest rate environment than we have been dealing with for the last 40 years. And I think some of that is reflected in what we're saying. So welcome, Bill. Thank you, Bill. Bill, you're muted. I just got off a board meeting, so. Thank you, Bill, for coming. We were, uh, we were just getting primed for you. So okay. here we go. So uh, again, it's my pleasure to introduce Bill Longbreak. So most of you probably know him. He is our executive in residence, has been at Smith School for since 2009, and he teaches a lot of courses for us. But in his role as executive in residence, he actually provides guidance, interacts with our faculty. So it's really a great pleasure to welcome Bill to this conversation. So uh, Cliff and I, we are kind of getting primed for you, to, for your insights, for your expertise. So Bill, uh, I will ask you again what I asked Cliff. Tell us your view of the liquidity crisis that we've, or is this a liquidity crisis, I guess I should ask. Well, Based the, on what the, has happened. So the, the simple answer to your question is yes. Right? <laughs> uh, or how bad is the liquidity crisis is what I no, should have it, asked it's a, it, I think it's going to be a rolling crisis. All right. It's not like it's instantaneous and over and done. Uh, and there's some, just some reasons for that. Well, let me just uh, quickly do a little framing and then uh, Cliff had prepared 
quite a number of questions here, which are all excellent. And and uh, perhaps, uh, is he on? I'm yes, here. he is on. Well, yes, oh, he there, is on. Oh, there you <laughs> are. There you are. I couldn't see you. So I, I just want to start out by saying that in, when you have the market events of the sort that uh, have now erupted, they don't come out of nowhere. And you might sort of think that when you look at the details of Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank, who are the two that failed over the weekend, uh, because they all, both of them have very specific and unique aspects. And we'll get into that probably when we talk about risk management on the institutional level. But the stage has been set long ago by a number of events. Uh, I just today uh, completed writing my monthly economic letter, which is probably by now posted on the uh, Center for Financial Policy website. And it uh, will be in the Brain Trust uh, that's released tomorrow. And in, in that uh, letter, I actually do talk about both perspectives, the long-term perspective as well as the uh, idiosyncratic aspects of the two banks in question. The long-term, I think it's important to understand that it actually, in my judgment, goes back to 2008 and the Fed's response to the great financial crisis at that time. And uh, the innovation in monetary policy was quantitative easing. And initially that uh, was important to stabilize, uh, provide liquidity in the housing market, mortgage-backed securities market, as well as the treasury market, but it morphed over time into a tool of monetary policy, not just to provide liquidity and, and stabilize markets, but actually to try to influence and control long-term interest rates. And that's where I think things went, uh, began to go sideways. Then you had uh, the intervention of the pandemic, uh, unexpected, uh, again, a return to uh, significant quantitative easing, but simultaneously, uh, the federal government did not one, but three uh, fiscal uh, bills. This poured tons and tons of money into the economy. The Fed soaked that up uh, to a large extent by buying treasury securities, kept interest rates across the curve uh, very, very low. It was thought at the time that that uh, was sensible given the circumstances, but it did set the stage for today's problem by uh, flooding banks with deposits and uh, far beyond their ability to lend. And uh, you know, banks are there to have a net interest margin to make money and to pay their shareholders. And uh, every single bank, and I actually the board meeting I just concluded as a national bank regulated by the controller of the currency. And uh, we had the same problem, every, every bank did where you had all these deposits with nowhere to put them except into securities. So that then leads into the uh, more direct problem is anytime you have a system-wide event that screws up uh, the world, you're always going to have a few outliers out there that are the first to go. And uh, generally they're ones that uh, have taken made assumptions about uh, the world that turned out to be totally off wrong and they get caught and that's what happened here so that's probably a little bit of an overview but uh, you know why don't we go directly uh, cliff to your questions or basu if you have some questions well uh, i actually but since uh, we were waiting for you i actually asked a few of those questions to cliff and we got his answers but i would love to hear from you as well so my first question is how worried should we be as individuals is this something that can happen to other banks as well? Yeah, well, the answer again is yes, it can happen to other banks. Uh, actually, uh, there's a lot of data that's been put out in the last few days. Uh, you know, the people are, are on top of this because there's many money managers out there advising clients and so forth. And so I, I've actually listened into some webinars where there's been detailed commentary about that. The there's a rich, rich data on the on all insured banks. That's just the and you can sort it and you can slice it and dice it and you can see kind of who's uh, close to the line. And uh, 
if anybody's interested, I actually have for about the top 25 banks, detailed mark-to-market information, tangible capital information, and so forth. And the answer is there are others that are thinly capitalized and could be subject to uh, failure, but interest rate risk doesn't necessarily lead to failure unless you have the bank round, which is what did in uh, Silicon Valley Bank and uh, basically Signature Bank as well. And the Fed's tried to, or Fed and the FDIC and the Treasury have tried to uh, cut that risk off by creating, you know, exercising the systemic risk exception in Section 13.3 of the Federal Reserve Act which then allowed the FDIC to actually uh, make uninsured depositors whole. Fed followed that up, as, as you all know, with the uh, change in the discount window collateral rules and then set up the, uh, the uh, facility, which is, I haven't memorized the acronym yet, but that allows banks to borrow up to one year at the uh, one year basically equivalent of the Fed funds rate or the OIS rate plus 10 basis points, which is almost a giveaway at this point. But that pretty much assures that even the the banks that have the large mark-to-market losses in their securities portfolio, and maybe even are technically insolvent on a tangible capital basis, uh, probably at this point, uh, you're not going to see any more failures because of bank runs. But there are other problems in the system. So I'll give you an example, uh, Basu. Yesterday, uh, I had a conversation with uh, CBRE, which is a, a very large national real estate broker and advisor. And essentially what th- they said to me is that things in the office market are deteriorating very, very rapidly. And uh, that's a crisis that's unfolding. That's of a different sort because it's credit and credit is not like interest rate risk. Credit is, is real losses. And uh, that's the sort of thing where uh, we will be tested on that. Probably not immediately, although to a certain extent, Credit Suisse's problem today is related to its credit issues. But the reason I say that is that the world changed with COVID in terms of worker uh, approach to you know, work at work from home and large companies are still grappling with, do we bring workers back? Do we bring them back full time? But the bottom line is on a macro basis is the demand for office space is plummeted. Mm-hmm. And that's likely to be a sustained issue. That's not going to go away. And what will happen is leases come up for renewal. Those companies are going to not renew them or they're going to negotiate lower rates. And so cash flow problems of significance are ahead for anybody that's lent on commercial real estate office space. So I I don't see this uh, particular crisis as going away, but I do see it evolving and developing. And it's linked again back to monetary policy. Uh, The monetary policy to fight inflation at this point is intentionally withdrawing liquidity from the system. It's intentionally making it more expensive to borrow. And that's part of the, uh, it's not a secret, The Fed wants to reduce aggregate demand so that they can take the steam out of the inflation. That's kind of a long answer of a Sue. So the short answer was yes. The long answer (laughs) is I gave you some reasons why. We were hoping you would say no, but that's, uh, you know, the reality is what is reality. I asked this question to Cliff, so I will ask you again. And before I turn it over to Cliff to for him to ask the question, because that was our plan. So as we know, the FDIC stepped in to insure the uninsured deposits over $250,000. In your opinion, was this the right strategy? Does this create a moral hazard for the future? Well, it absolutely creates a moral hazard for the future. It actually creates a moral hazard for the present. Because even though uh, supposedly this systemic risk exception applied only to Signature Bank, and to uh, Silicon Valley Bank. What occurred on Monday and and continues to occur is that depositors uh, actually withdrew large amounts of money from regional banks and to a certain extent, smaller community banks 
and put them in the big SIFI banks, the Citigroup, uh, Bank of America, JP Morgan Chase and Wells Fargo, the four big guys. And uh, what they're what depositors are saying is, hey, we're not sure that uh, if one of these other regional banks gets into trouble, that you'll honor, uh, you'll make the same exception. So I think that the uh, the uh, once you take that step, and this is actually the first time that the uh, they've ever actually exercised that provision in the Federal Reserve Act. Uh, once you've taken that step, there's probably no going back, and so implicitly. Uh, what happens if if another uh, bank of a hundred billion or thereabouts, which was about the size of Signature, gets into trouble? Uh, will they be a systemic risk too, or will they, they find an excuse to not do it? And if they find an excuse to not do it, how will the market react? So yes, there's huge yeah. moral moral hazard then, because if you're a banker, uh, and and you know that uh, look, you're going to get bailed out or at least your deposits get bailed out, maybe not your stock holdings, uh, the inclination to take greater risks, it, it's it's real. Thank you, Bill. Cliff, I want to give it back to you and I'm going to go to the chat box. So just to further all of you, if you have any questions for Bill or for Cliff, feel free to put it on the chat box and I will be able to, I'll be happy to convey that to them. Great. So Cliff, take it on. Absolutely. Bill, we were we, we, we kind of walked through a little bit on the overview of how both SVB and Signature kind of came to their troubles, if you will. And uh, I'd love to get your take on on that, uh, particularly since and, and by way of sort of introduction again, I mean, Bill, you know, is he's a big name in, in the banking sector for all of you who uh, aren't there, uh, aren't, aren't, aren't uh, recognizing that he um, uh, was, uh, among other things, the vice chair uh, up there at uh, Washington Mutual, just a small uh, savings and loan that you may or may not have heard of. It was the sixth largest bank in the country, Cliff, when it failed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think our offices were, were close by each other, weren't they? Um, hey, at, uh, Cliff, in, in interest of full disclosure, uh, Cliff and I worked together. <laughs> That's okay. We're, yeah, a we, we're a team, yeah. though. Um, but, but, but on that one, seriously, I mean, you sit on, uh, you know, the board, uh, of one of the very large uh, credit unions these days, federal credit unions, among other about other banks and whatnot, and you sit on the risk committee or had uh, sat on that risk committee. One of the things that strikes me coming out of this, and you see a lot in the in the news headlines about this too, is where was the board on this? What are your thoughts as as a board member? What where, where do your thoughts naturally go to in a situation like this about how these events unfolded at these two institutions? All right, so the board was asleep, uh, but so were the supervisors, because there is no way that uh, Silicon Valley Bank's asset liability mismatch, which was horribly egregious, should have ever gotten past regulatory or supervisory review. Yeah. But uh, so I put the blame squarely on the table for both the board and for the supervisors. And by the way, the supervisors in the case of Silicon Valley Bank was the uh, state of California, but the backup is the FDIC. And I actually, uh, what you probably didn't disclose, Cliff, is I was the chief financial officer of the FDIC back in the mid 1990s for a couple of years. And I know how that organization works. And I actually have deep respect for the quality of their examination process. So I'm a little bit uh, mystified as to why the FDIC um, missed that, because it's so obvious when you look at the numbers that they'd taken a huge bet, uh, totally unhedged, uh, yeah. you know, tried to cover up with some accounting things, which are perfectly legal and so forth. Right. But but the the board the board uh, I was just uh, the board meeting I just concluded we were chuckling a little bit about well if the board that of this bank that I'm on in, in Washington D.C. which is a small community bank had been the board of Silicon Valley Bank it probably never would have failed and the reason I say that is that we're very uh, again as I mentioned earlier the, uh, the the little bank still had uh, at one point about a forty percent loan to deposit ratio during the pandemic and we had oodles and oodles of cash. Yes, we bought mortgage-backed securities, but the uh, duration of those securities now uh, with the rates blasting out is only three years, whereas uh, 
with uh, Silicon Valley Bank. I think, Griff, you probably know the exact number, but I think it was around six years or seven yeah, years. Yeah, that's about like right. That. Yeah, a little over six. Yep. Yeah, a little over six. So there's a big difference in terms of the mark-to-market loss when you have much shorter duration. And yeah. uh, I can tell you that this this bank uh, uh, that, uh, again, the D.C. little com commercial bank, it has tangible equity uh, that's actually above the current market price for the stock. And that's after marking to market all the securities. And uh, we don't have a single dollar and held the material securities 100% and available for sale. Interesting. Do you think that, uh, I mean, your background, very extensive. I, I think at one point you were the, weren't you the first uh, enterprise chief risk officer for Washington Mutual? Well, the first one, I think, or something yeah. like that. Yeah. So but, 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 but fortunately, you came along, Chris, and were my, uh, Cliff, and were my successor, and you did a much better job. I don't know about that. <laughs> but, uh, I got out. Well, you did have the good sense that when you weren't being listened to, that you departed. Yeah, that's true. But then I have out of the frying pan into the fire city group. That was no easy mess either. Um, but 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 on that, I mean, you're 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 unusual. One of the things uh, back when Wells Fargo had their retail banking scandal, I went back and I looked at the five top U.S. banks, looked at the 32 members then of their risk committees of these institutions, and I looked at the bios of those individuals pretty closely, and I said, okay. If, if I'm if I'm CEO at these companies and I want somebody who's going to be looking over us to make sure that we're going to guard against risk, because I think of them as the first line of defense, I want people that actually had some working knowledge of risk management. Three out of the 32 that I counted had any kind of background that was close to that. So how do we how how do we change things? I mean, you can heap additional reforms onto these companies, but at the end of the day, doesn't the how do you get the board focused on engaging in credible challenge with management on very technically complicated risk strategies like this? Uh, well, if you have the answer to that, Cliff, let me let me know. Uh, the only the only response I can give is because look, uh, board culture is very very important, and, and uh, boards self govern. And if they don't pay attention to those things, who's going to call call them on it? Certainly yeah. not shareholders, because shareholders are not equipped to do that kind of oversight. The only uh, alternative is the supervisors. And as we've talked about, the supervisors failed miserably in this case on the asset liability management. They obviously also failed in terms of assuring that the board composition and oversight was appropriate. So, yeah, I can expect that's not going to be a fun time for any of them. And, uh, and well, you know, what, what's required by law is the inspector general of the FDIC is required to do an analysis of every single bank failure. And that's been started now in the case of uh, Silicon Valley Bank and also Signature Bank. I expect that it will be a scathing report when it comes out. It'll probably take about a year, however. What do you think? Uh, you know, so there's been this issue, right, uh, that uh, that's going around where SVB lobbied heavily to not be in the club, so to speak, that would be under heightened scrutiny for more intensive regulatory oversight uh, before I think it was uh, $50 billion in consolidated assets or something like that got you into the club. And then they bumped that up to 250, greater than 250. And so they they skirted that one. Um, do you think the feds are going to go back and, and revisit that and uh, ratchet that back down? Uh, so the, the the regulators actually have the flexibility to apply the types of supervisory oversight to the uh, non cefi banks, the ones that are under $250 billion, if they choose. Uh, they don't have the power by regulation to do so, but, the, but uh, I'll give you an example. You mentioned the credit union board that I'm on. It's actually the third or fourth largest credit union in the country. It has $35 billion in assets, and it's regulated by the uh, National Credit Union Administration. Now, you might say, oh, well, there's a, there's a weak read, but no, they're actually uh, apply to us, and we do this every year, and I actually had a uh, session on Monday uh, with the risk committee that you mentioned earlier, Cliff, uh, with the management 
And what we were doing was the first round on doing the stress, capital stress testing using the Federal Reserve uh, extreme stress scenarios. And, we will, and we've been doing that for five years. So the National Credit Union Administration is applying to us the same stress testing that's required of the large SIFI banks. And we do that very seriously. We actually, a couple of years ago, uh, did a scenario where we had a massive deposit run. That was our idiosyncratic scenario. And uh, I could tell you, we couldn't we couldn't push the capital ratio below the uh, 5% level, which is kind of the bogey. Wow, that's impressive. Uh, well, I mean, and again, it, it, there's there's many moving parts because you've got credit risk, you've got interest rate risk, and uh, then, then growing an idiosyncratic scenario, what we did is we said, well, Amazon, uh, which is headquartered in Seattle, that's where this bank is located or credit union is located, uh, pulls up stakes and leaves. And we have kind of a massive uh, unemployment problem and, and uh, a flight uh, of deposits out of the bank. But uh, again, you do those kinds of exercises and you take them seriously and you can make adjustments in your asset liability management strategy, your credit uh, uh, books. It's not rocket science. And Cliff, you know that because you that's what you teach and that's what you write about. Well, in, you know, one of the things that, that sort of resonated with me, uh, when you start seeing headlines that start talking about the chief risk officer, usually you never hear about the chief risk officer. They kind of stay behind the scenes and they never get to talk to anybody until something bad happens, right? So we had this bad thing happen. And one of the things that we that's been revealed is that they uh, you know, they're saying, oh, they didn't have a CRO, you know, they had a vacancy in that seat for eight months. So is that a problem, do you think? Or uh, did, were other things kind of conspiring and that just happened to be coincidental? Well, yeah, yes, yes, it's definitely a problem, Cliff, but also since you've been a chief risk officer in two banks, and you were also before that, I think, you did risk management at, was it Freddie Mac or yeah, both both of them. I, I, I both have to be them. at every everywhere. Well, so but, but, but it, it gets to the culture of the institution because a trip chief risk officer or an audit auditor, you know, the auditors have statutory independence, risk officers don't, but uh, you know, the culture is similar. That if yeah. you're not accepted in terms of your role by management and have voice without uh, being ignored, uh, then it, doesn't matter whether you have a risk officer or not. And I suspect, and this doesn't come out in the report, I expect, but I suspect that the risk officer at uh, Silicon Valley was there for uh, window dressing, but not for substance. Yeah, that's unfortunate. We see that happen too often. Let me let me ask you this then. I mean, if you were uh, FDIC chair for a day, where would you where would you steer things? Or even if you were sort of the overall banking czar, what would you? What do you think are the actions that are needed to prevent this from happening, or is that just simply too naive for us to think that this can't happen again, no matter what kind of regulations? We well, have? unfortunately, uh, I've been around this world now for <laughs> quite a long time, uh, Cliff, and uh, these things tend to recur. It's just part of human failings and so forth, but. As FDIC chair, there's a clear feeling that since the FDIC was the backup regulator for Silicon Valley, a clear feeling on the supervisory side there. So definitely I would be uh, doing quietly, separate from the inspector general's formal statutory uh, investigation, quietly internally doing a full-scale review of the supervisory efforts and making adjustments. Now, let me, let me ask you a question. Uh, today's news, right? So it seems like every day is something new. Um, Credit Suisse in the headlines for pretty much the whole day. Uh, I think toward the end of the day, it sounded like I, I, I was doing some other things, but it sounded like their regulatory authority in Switzerland sort of, you know, calm folks by being able to kind of say, we're going to throw them a lifeline. To what extent do you kind of see Credit Suisse as sort of in the same camp of what we just came through for these two institutions versus is it something altogether different or just happen to be coincidental? What, what's your take on how Credit Suisse fits into all of this? Well, look, Cliff, I don't know that much about the details of Credit Suisse, but what I can tell you is that Credit Suisse for the last three years or so 
has been periodically in the news as a, one of the weakest invest, universal investment banks in the world. So it, it's not surprising that they get picked on. Yeah. And what happens in, when you get uh, people shaken up, as has happened now since last uh, Thursday or so, is they start feeling the layers of the onion back and, and no longer kind of just glossing the surface, but uh, digging into individual institutions. And the ones that, uh, whose numbers, and I, I mentioned I have the numbers, they look, don't look good, they could become then uh, suspect. And we have in the world of equity, short sellers who are vultures. You know, they, they look for the weak links and uh, they go after them. And that's what happened last Thursday with Silicon Valley Bank. You not only had depositors yanking their money out quickly, you had the short sellers uh, who were having a field day. Yeah, well, we saw that no way too, right? Yes, yes. Make and, sure, and, anyway. I mean, they're out there to make money and, and you know, yeah. they don't care who gets screwed or who gets hurt. And that's, uh, right. that's part of the process. So. Uh, that's why I would say that there probably will be others that will get tested, whether they uh, end up uh, in receivership is another matter. But uh, right now, being a shareholder of uh, uh, some of these banks, particularly if the data looks uh, a little weak in terms of their tangible capital and their balance sheet uh, mix and their credit and so forth, they will be tested. Yeah, I'm with you on that Credit Suisse thing. I mean, they were one of those that stepped into the Archegos, uh scandal if you remember not that long yeah. ago too i mean they've, they've had a few issues so you're right that's 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 problematic i mean credit, credit suisse will end up being probably skinny down and you know, you know their ability to recover from this will be limited uh, will they fail outright well it's not in the interest of the swiss government to let that happen right i, I might i might add that uh, uh going back to uh the asset liability mismatch that uh brought down Silicon Valley Bank, pure interest rate risk, because their loan book wasn't all that that big. And I don't think there were serious credit issues in their loan book. But uh, this long period of uh, actually negative rates in Europe and uh, you know how do banks make money? Well, the European Central Bank actually uh, did some, some nice liquidity facilities that actually were intended to create profits for those banks that were suffering through negative interest rates. but And uh, that's several billion euros still outstanding. That will wind down over the course of the next uh, year or so. And so I wouldn't be surprised if there are more problems that develop in some of the European banks as time passes. Yeah, it, it's it's an interesting story. I'm I'm kind of keeping my eye on the time. Make sure. Yeah, Basu Cliff, gonna... uh, Cliff, if it's okay with you, can I get a couple of questions from the Absol audience? Absolutely. Okay. I see that, I see so that there's, there's one in chat. Right, um, right. So maybe do you want to hit that one. Yeah, first? I want to get that. So this is from one of our colleagues, believers. So his question is regarding the moral hazards from the depositor side. What percentage of customers have deposits in a bank of over two hundred fifty thousand dollars? And shouldn't the businesses, that's the financial officers, recognize the risk of putting too much money in a bank? So it goes back to the moral hazard issue, Bill. Yeah, well, so, you know, I think the data is out there now in Silicon Valley Bank. Over 90% of the deposits were uninsured. Mm -hmm. but that had to do with their business model. All right. Uh, I can give you the data on... Uh, the ECU, the 35 billion credit unions, all retail, and the uninsured deposits there are 27%. So it's a very, very different mix of clientele overall. But if you choose your business model, and you know, arguably the Silicon Valley's business model was not stupid, uh, they concentrated on a particular sector, the startup tech sector, and work with venture capitalists. Uh, they were actually a significant lender in climate uh, development work and so forth. And you could say hey, that that actually uh, makes good sense as a business model. And uh, yes, that brought along large amounts of deposits that were uninsured just because of the business model. I guess I would go back and say, hey, uh, if you choose that business strategy, 
then uh, that's something that uh, you're going to have to live with the potential for a deposit run. So you better be very careful about your, how you run it. I might uh, just make a, a comment on a different level, which goes back to one of the earlier questions about uh, the moral hazard issue. Mm -hmm. There is talk right now, and we'll see where it goes, about, well, maybe the FDIC should, across the board, ensure all deposits and stop this fiction of, uh, of uh, 250000 That has uh, implications that uh, uh, I'm not sure I can express what they are, but uh, it would be uh, a very different cup of tea. So just, again, pay attention to that dialogue, because I expect what always happens after these events is that people start second guessing and say, hey, why did the system break down? Where are the holes? Can we plug them up? And uh, I expect in due course, there'll be hearings, there'll be uh, finger pointing. Uh, Elizabeth Warren's already started doing that. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. So I think the question that is in everybody's minds, I'll just come out and say this. So how is 2023 different from 2008? Or is this a portent of things to come? Well, what, we, either, what we experienced in 2008, will that happen again? Well, so there, there are definitely differences. Uh, for instance, uh, 2008 was essentially a very deep and broad uh, over leverage and uh, poor credit quality throughout the entirety of the financial sector. And it started with the, uh, you know, the housing bubble and uh, went through. You don't have that sort of situation in the current uh, state of the world. Uh, take, for example, crypto, which we know has been highly speculative and, and uh, very few banks have engaged in that signature bank that uh, Silvergate uh, did, uh, it didn't fail, but it's liquidating itself. But that's been relatively contained as a small market and it's not a systemic wide issue. So you don't have those kinds of things present that brought down the, uh, basically the, uh, the big guys. In, in the meantime, you have higher capital levels uh, across the board and uh, all these, you know, tests uh, that, that we, I mentioned earlier the capital stress testing and so forth. But what you do have is a different kind of problem, which again goes back to what I said at the outset about the macro problem, where the uh, Federal Reserve, through its uh, quantitative easing and uh, zero interest rate policy, actually, and then in combination with the fiscal stimulus that came out of the pandemic created abundant liquidity, and it drove interest rates on a inflation adjust basis negative, and it pumped up the values of uh, existing assets overall. And uh, when you unwind that, and the interest rates now across the yield curve are back to positive spreads, at least they were before the last couple of days, uh, mm -hmm. it changes the ball game on a macro basis in significant ways and unwinding something uh, does, as I guess Warren Buffett says, when the tide goes out, out you'll see who's been swimming naked. <laughs> and, okay. And, and so there yet, uh, that's the overall macro situation. It's different from 2008, but it's different in a way that still doesn't mean that it's without potential consequences. Thanks, Bill. I don't see any more. Cliff, do you want to end with your, we will probably a couple of minutes to go before we end? Sure. I mean, I'll, I, I, I'll, I, I'll give you the privilege of asking the last question. <laughs> I, 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 you know, at this point, I mean, I, I, I think we've covered quite a bit of, uh, of, of that topic. I would, I would just simply, I think you covered it with whether or not there's parallels to 2008 versus, uh, you know, today. Um, but uh, I guess, well, the next couple of weeks, should we expect to see more frenzied movements in the markets in general? Will we start to see some, you know, moderation of this? What do you just in the in the near term? What's your expectation? Okay, well, so so I actually want to talk about one more topic here before we quit. But in response to your question, uh, the, the pattern that I've experienced in the past is these crises tend to be rolling. 
is that you'll have an event, and we had an event that actually gets everybody's attention and stirs them up, and you have a bit of panic in the air. Time passes, there's a temporary solution, and uh, things settle down. But if you've got an underlying problem, which is what I'm suggesting that there is, inevitably there's another event, and during the, uh, the and the, which stirs things up again. During the uh, great financial crisis, I counted about six different stages, and it started in December of 2007, and it culminated with the failure of Lehman in uh, October of 2008. But and, and you can go back and look at those events. And in between times, actually, the, uh, the market said, well, it's over. It's been contained. Well, it hadn't been. Uh, the other thing I just wanted to mention, and this is worth paying attention to because it's a little bit on a different wavelength, but it's consequential, is the, uh, the Fed now is in a, uh, has a real dilemma because part of the reason that uh, we're in this period of fragility from a liquidity standpoint, goes back to the monetary policy that's being pursued to fight inflation. And up until Thursday, in fact, last week when uh, Jay Powell testified before Congress, he sort of let it uh, out that maybe uh, the Fed might, because employment data has been hot and inflation isn't coming down as fast as, as hoped for, that uh, the Fed might have to raise uh, the Fed bunch rate 50 basis points. Well, their meeting is next Wednesday, the 22nd of March. And uh, the if you follow the rates curve, uh, last Wednesday, after he had made those remarks, uh, the futures curve had plugged in another uh, 75 basis points in rate increases over the remainder of the year, which would take the range up to 575. And as of yesterday, and I haven't looked at it today, uh, the rates curve in terms of Fed fund future came down 125 basis points. And essentially, if you do the math, that means that the increase that the Fed's already done this year would be rescinded uh, sometime later this year. So the Fed's dilemma at this point, to put it as succinctly as I can, is the market is expecting the Fed to pause and not raise rates next week. Indeed, uh, maybe even uh, decrease rates either uh, March or at the April meeting. And uh, inflation is definitely not yet under control. It's edging down, but uh, maybe it's sticky. It's uncertain at this point that we don't have enough time yet to know for sure. Uh, so they have to make that decision is do they continue with the rate increases and perhaps uh, stir more trouble from a liquidity standpoint in the market or or do they uh, uh, pause and perhaps lose control of the inflation fight? It's, 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 it's a tough dilemma and it's not clear what the answer will be. So watch very close, carefully. Now, what the outcome is of the FOMC meeting is next Wednesday. Good point. Really good point. All right. Thank you, both of you. This was a wonderful experience for all of us. And I really appreciate all of you who were able to join us at such short notice. We obviously wanted to do this while the, you know, it was still hot on the news and more to come, I guess. I think that's what we got from both Cliff and Bill. That yeah, you, you is... may have a month or two where things kind of quiet down, although I, I'll feel more certain about that after next Wednesday's FOMC meeting. Right. Yeah, yeah. So with that, I think we'll thank all of you, unless any of you have a last minute question for either Bill or Cliff. Again, I really, really appreciate both of you taking the time at this time of the year when... We are going through finals and exams and a lot of other things going on. So really appreciate both of you. And thanks for all of you for being here at such short notice. And, um, you know, hopefully we will not have to do this too often, but if this happens <laughs> no. again. <laughs> well, you know, I, I don't mind uh, ch chatting with uh, folks from time to time. Right, right. So hopefully we will not have to do this too often but if we do if this happens i hope we can count on you again to come and 
talk to the Smith community.